Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing YouTube channel. We're working through every company in the S&P 500 and today is Broadcom Incorporated, ticker AVGO. So over the next few minutes, I'll discuss both my thoughts on the valuation of this company and its business quality. Let's dive on in. First up, this company has a $214 billion market cap, relatively similar enterprise value. So we know there's relatively little net debt. Actually, sorry, it looks like 20 to $30 billion in net debt. So quite a lot of debt. Semiconductor and semiconductor equipment industry. When we go to the business description, it sees that they design, develop, and supply semiconductor devices. Um analog, both have semiconductor solutions and infrastructure and provide set top boxes on a tip, SOCs, you have ethernet switching, Wi-Fi, blue chip. Um, so a bunch of different things, fiber optics within the semiconductor industry. Now, when the return on invested capital, this will give us a little bit of information. We can see basically in 2007, they, had no profits. We'll just not count that one in particular because it looks like maybe the company was being started up then or doesn't have history from then. But we can see one, two years of losses out of the last 14 years. That's a little high, a little higher than I'd like. Also, this is a pretty cyclical company. You go from making, you know, 5% return on capital in 2008, losing money in 2009. Now, again, that is a recession. So you got to take that with a grain of salt, up to making 24%, 29%, 25%, 20% from 2010 to 2013. They drop again to 4% in 2014, up again at 15%, down to losses in 2016. And then they finally get up to 27% again in 2018. But the last three years have all been pretty low, 5%, 4%, and 10%. So very cyclical and unpredictable. That unpredictability more so than the actual numbers, signals it's a relatively low quality business. It's not so much about what the numbers are. It's the fact that the cyclicality means it's hard to put a good valuation on this. And we'll see this when it gets to valuation, but that's a really a quality metric is the fact that these numbers are jumping around so much. Now, when we go to 10-year median returns, we see return on equity of 16% which is a good number, but again, it's averaging out all these up and down numbers and return on invested capital of 8%. So the only way you get this is with some leverage. But what's interesting to me is immediately below this, I see 10-year Kager. You have revenue growth of 28%, asset growth of 40%, free cash flow growth of 30%, earnings per share growth of 21%. When you see all of these growth numbers being higher than your return on equity, being higher than your return on assets, the only way you do this is if you're taking on debt and you're, gro and you're issuing shares. There's no other way for this math to work unless you're issuing shares constantly and you're issuing new debt constantly. So something's going on there in order to drive that revenue. Otherwise, you just can't grow. Those numbers wouldn't add up. Likewise, the fact that you're growing your assets faster than free cash flow, earnings per share, and revenue suggests that you're going to get worse and worse returns over time, which is why you've fallen from that you know 25 plus percent range in 2012 down to the 10 percent range in 2021. And you can see that kind of general decline in the quality of the business in terms of their returns on assets. Now, obviously, these are these revenue growths have been amazing. You've basically 10 x your revenue over the course of decades. So that the growth is really good. You went from 2.3 billion in revenue to 27 billion in revenue over the last year. So absolutely amazing growth. I mean, if you 15 x your growth profit, gross profit from 1.1 to 16.8 billion. So very very good returns there. You can see a growing gross margin. So maybe as they're getting scale, they're getting better and better returns. And operating profit now up to that, you know, 31 percent operating profits a really attractive number. So that's how you get a 7x, you know, EPS number. But that growth is likely being built into this valuation, which is why you see some very high valuation ratios, PE of 27, price to book of 9.3, price to sales of 7.5. All these numbers are high. I wouldn't pay this much for a company like this, or even a much better company than this, because you don't really justify that. I mean, if you're paying a price to book of 9.3, when you have return on equity of 16%, it's implying a substantially reduced 
return on equity for your actual shares because this is the return on book equity and then your return on book equity is divided by the price to book ratio to kind of get to what you're actually going to have so to me the company is overvalued i'd be interested in something maybe a below 15 it doesn't strike me as a super high quality company pe of 15 is what an average company in the s p 500 should trade for and so 15 or less starts to get me interested because you do have strong growth numbers if you can if you can have huge growth numbers that can be very 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 attractive. Anytime you're 10xing revenue in a decade, that's looking really, really good. But it's really hard to know, are they going to 10x this again? You know, in 10 years, in 2032, are they going to have 270 billion in revenue? That seems unlikely, but you'd have to know a little bit more about the company. So if you're liking this video so far, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell because I'm uploading new videos each and every week, I'm going through the entire S&P 500. And if you want to get those videos, you need to be subscribed so you can get them in the future. So we go to our income statement here. And you can see a little bit more of what I'm talking about here in terms of the dilution. In order to grow so much faster than your return on equity, you have to issue more equity. And that's what they've gone. They've gone from 244 shares outstanding to 410 shares outstanding over the course of decades. So even though you've 10 extra revenue and you've, you know, 16 extra net income, you've basically not doubled your shares outstanding, but I mean, it's like 70 or 80% when I just ballpark look at this. So that's not killing you because your EPS is still growing. You're still growing your EPS very quickly, but it's not growing as much as it would be if you didn't have to issue those shares. I don't like this because it makes it really hard for me to know in the future what I'm going to get as a shareholder. Now the balance sheet, you can clearly see they're growing their assets massively. They've gone from 2.4 billion in assets to 75 billion in assets. And this is what's killing your return on equity and return on assets is you have these massive, clearly acquisitions taking place in 2015, 2016, growing that goodwill um, by 23 billion. So they overpaid for an acquisition of 23 billion compared to the balance sheet value. They took on an additional 12 billion in intangible assets there. So really big asset growth. And you have other big acquisitions in 2019, 2018, 2020. So all these acquisitions are being rolled into this asset base. And that matters because even though the tangible assets, this property and plant and equipment is much, much lower, you need to take into account as an investor, not just the tangible assets, but also the intangible assets that the company is acquiring, because that is actually where your return is going to be based on. So those big acquisitions have to be taken into account. You can also see they have $40 billion in long-term debt. So when you compare $40 billion in long-term debt to net income, they basically have over four times their net income in debt. Um, that's very, very leveraged for the company. And it's something that only works when you have low interest rates. So that's a big risk for this company going forward. You can see how these acquisitions are being played in here. You know, so they're issuing, they're having to use a lot of cash in 2016, 18, 19, and 20 to make these acquisitions, but they're also issuing shares. They're also issuing debt. And so, yes, they're growing, but that growth has been turbocharged by the acquisitions and it just makes it very hard to predict the future. And they're embedding these large asset bases into this return on invested capital. So for me, Broadcom is a pass. It's just simply too cyclical for me to predict the future. It's hard for me to predict the effectiveness and the likelihood of future acquisitions. So I would pass on those reasons. I'd also pass on valuation. This valuation is at least 2x too high, especially because it's not like you have return on equity of 30 or 40% where you can self-fund this growth. They're having to, to fund the growth with debt. They're having to fund the growth with share issuance. So it just makes it very hard to predict. Also, you're not going to repeat this 10 year CAGR of revenue growth over the next decade because you're not going to get to $270 billion in revenue. I just think that's probably too high compared to the size of the industry. We'll see. But for me, I pass on Broadcom. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell because I'm working through every company in the S&P 500. And if you want those videos, you want to be subscribed so you can get those videos as I upload them each and every week on the channel. Thank you for listening. Till next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth.